For generations, life in our communities have been defined by brokenheartedness. Life in too many of our communities have been defined by brokenheartedness for generations. This is what I began to understand as I began my life in ministry in Focus Pittsburgh on Center Avenue, right in the heart of the Hill District. I remember one day I was uh, walking into the brand new grocery store that we have up in the Hill District, and as I was walking into the store, there was a man who saw me. And as he saw me walking, he waved me down. He said, Father, Father. And of course, I stopped, and he came to me and said, you've got to pray for me. You've got to pray for me right now. My nephew was just shot and killed on Brownsville Road. He said, I'm 62 years old. I tried to go to work today, but I couldn't do it. I'm 62 years old. I've lost my wife. I've lost my son. I've lost my daughter. And now I've lost my nephew. And as he said this, his, he began to break down and he began to cry profusely, so much so that he couldn't even barely hold himself up. I grabbed him by the shoulder to, 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 to get him stable a little bit. But this man broke down right in the open parking lot. And as this happened, there was an old woman who was coming out of the grocery store leaning on a shopping cart or a buggy, as we say in Pittsburgh. <laughs> and she was moving ever so slowly. This is what she said. Father God, come by here. Come by here, Father God, there's too much pain. And she stopped and she joined him. She didn't know him, she didn't know me. And she began to share her pain and her loss. And then there was another woman who saw this happening. She came and she joined and she began to share her pain and her loss. And then there was another woman who came and she began to share her pain and her loss. And right there, right then and there, that circle of pain transformed into a circle of healing. Why? Because there's too much pain in our communities. There has been for too many generations. You know, in my work, Sometimes people say, we've got to get people opportunities. But because of all of this experience, I began to ask the question, are people healthy enough to sustain opportunity in our community? I mean, after we have suffered so much, are we healthy enough to sustain opportunity in our community? You know, the event in my life that, that influenced my thinking on this the most was the Iraq War. In March of 2003, I crossed into Iraq on the very first day of the ground war with the Army's 3rd Infantry Division. In the moment we tasted combat for the first time, we knew that our lives would never again be the same. Eight months into our tour, the Army brought in an Army psychologist to teach us about something I had never really heard of before in my life. Post-traumatic stress disorder. This idea that if we were going to go through uh, this experience, it would shatter our life so much so that some of us wouldn't even be able to reintegrate back into the, the society that we grew up in in our entire lives. We would be shattered at our core. And after the war and after I got out of the army, I came back home and I got into ministry and I started to work in my community. But then I realized something, something alarming, something, something terrifying. That when people began to walk into focus, they would ask for food or clothing or bus passes or IDs. That's what they would start with. But they would end up talking about this horrific pain, these horrific traumas that they had suffered from the time that they were a child up. And I began to realize something. That I saw so much more post-traumatic stress disorder in my own community than I ever saw when I was in the Army. After looking into this, I was alarmed to find out that 65% of African Americans have a lifetime exposure to trauma. I began to think about what the Army told us. One year at war will change your lives. And indeed, that happened to be true. But how much more is it true for our brothers and sisters who have spent their entire lives at war in our communities?
And worse yet, we weren't talking about this in any of our community meetings. You know, we'd go to community meetings and people would talk about, well, the building in this drawing is too high. And in this shred, we need to move the, bush, the bushes over here. But when we would spend time with the people, their hearts were filled with pain. Their hearts were brokenhearted. They were suffering and they needed healed. And we were not talking about this in community meetings. So four and a half years ago, we thought we have to change this. We have to make this a topic of discussion in our communities. And we began a series of meetings to discuss community trauma. Yes, this idea that there was so much trauma in our communities that it didn't matter what we experienced or what even uh, someone in our family experienced, we were hearing so much. It was happening all around us. The gun violence, the homelessness, the poverty, the addiction, the abuse, the incarceration. It became a way of life in our community and trauma became the lens through which we saw the world. And that was not all right. And when we talked about this trauma, community trauma, we came together and we resolved not to do nothing about this. We understand this is such a great problem, we've got to do something about this. We went to the universities. We said we've got to learn more about this. We engaged with Duquesne University and Dr. Matthew Walsh and Dr. Lisa Lopez Levers. They began to teach us about things we really didn't know about, adverse childhood experiences, the experience of trauma before the age of 18, that the more trauma we experience before the age of 18, the more likely we are gonna suffer from chronic unemployment, the more likely we're gonna uh, use tobacco, uh, suffer from substance abuse, but, but even if it has physiological consequences, the, mo the more likely we are to have uh, 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 di uh, heart disease, diabetes, broken bones, because trauma punishes our bodies. And what about post-traumatic stress disorder? We were alarmed to find out that 33% of African Americans had been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder and everything that went along with that. And what about the institution of slavery, post-traumatic slave syndrome? Sometimes we act like it was just that long ago, uh, not that long, but it really wasn't that long ago. This institution, this brutal institution and the culture that emerged from it. And what about the work of uh, uh, ge geneticists who in the emerging field of epigenetics are, are, are teaching us that perhaps trauma ha can be passed down from generation to generation by way of genetic mutation. And we understood we needed to think hard about what we were going to do with this. Our friends at Duquesne University taught us about a technique that the World Health Organization uses in some of the most uh, difficult political and economic environments around the world. This consultative workshop, this, this, this uh, attempt to problematize issues. Do you know why? Because we're always trying to deal with issues. But you know, issues don't have solutions. Problems have solutions. People say, what do you do about gun violence? I don't know. What do you do about education? I don't know. What do you do about world hunger? I don't know, because issues don't have solutions. Problems have solutions. And we understood that if we could bring community members together uh, with university experts to help us understand these issues and problematize these issues, we might be able to develop some solutions to some very old problems that had plagued us for far too long. This process of a consultative workshop eventually produced something that we now call trauma-informed community development. Trauma-informed community development. You know, it's amazing that when we think about developing our communities, communities that have suffered so much for so long that we aren't incorporating our understanding of trauma and how we can build our people in a way that they are healthy enough to sustain opportunity. I've seen too many people get jobs and lose jobs. I've seen too many people get into housing and lose housing. Why? Because they have been traumatized to the point that they are not healthy enough to sustain the opportunities that were placed at their feet. And what was the community response to these problems? Trauma-informed community development to establish and promote healthy, healing micro-communities. Certainly we began to think how hard it is to change an entire community, but a healthy, healing micro-community could be a block. And right away, 
We began to build a curriculum to train a new role that we began to call behavioral health community organizers. You see, there was nothing new about community organizers in our community. No, but what about community organizers who were trained to understand the trauma that we had suffered? Uh, what about community organizers that were trained to uh, uh, build a cohort of a block that was separated by generations of violence? What if we were able to train behavioral health community organizers who could, together with experts, facilitate an intervention on that block in an effort to, to make that block into a healthy healing micro community, behavioral health community organizers. And we set off on that task. And what of the people that don't live in blocks? What about the people who live in public housing? What about the people who live very transient lives? How many people in our community spend three nights here, four nights here, five nights there in unhealthy surroundings? But what if they came together? organically, and they bound themselves to others who also wanted to live healthy? What if they came together organically and bound themselves with others who also wanted to be healed? And what if they came together in a process of intervention and graduated into a housing cooperative where they each owned separate units, but they owned the property. They owned their community, and those units became like a little village, a little village that had a culture of health and well-being. And what about the center of this intervention? These behavioral health community organizers, what about the center of this in intervention? How we would go about building a plan that emerged from a consultative workshop. We would help this block problematize the same issues that we problematized years ago. The hope plan that each block would produce as a result of the consultative workshop that we would do on that block, hope which stands for health and well-being. And you know what we have to begin with? To relieve strain. Yes, because if someone's hungry, they're not listening. If somebody's thirsty, they're not listening. We came across a woman this past winter who was interested in this process, but we found out that she had no furnace, no heat for her and her son. And we thought before we can talk any more about health and well-being, we've got to get this woman a furnace. Relieve strain and then facilitate interventions to build health and resilience in our community. Oh, opportunity making. What if we, instead of going after individuals, took the cohort of all of the people who were not employed on that block, who were unemployed in that block, and we, and we presented opportunities to them at the very same time, all of them together, so that they could understand they were part of a cohort that the block themselves could celebrate in an effort to change the culture on that block to a culture that support, supports work instead of going after the individual, going after the whole block at the same time. Placemaking, understanding the principles of healthy housing and how much environment impacts the health and well-being of a community. Uh, e, engaging the influencers, that we would conduct the social network analysis on each and every block, on each and every housing, potential housing cooperative, so that we can understand it's not just the people that live there, but there are people outside of that block that absolutely influence the culture of that block. And once we had that mapped out, we could work together with partners to engage all of those influencers at the very same time in an effort to change the culture on that block into a culture of health and well-being. What if we could do this, and what if all of this was done by the block themselves? It's not us telling them, this is what you need. No, but this is the block themselves. What if they were the ones that said, this is what we need, and our, and our only job was to facilitate resources so that they could achieve their plan? It is their plan. And because it is their plan, this is their way of changing the culture of their block. And what if we could have one healthy block here? And what if we could have one healthy uh, housing cooperative here? That over time, the health of the overall community would change because these little healthy healing micro communities that popped up over all of our communities would spread this notion of hope and finally give people vehicle to transform their suffering into the circle of healing I mentioned in the beginning of this talk. And not only that, what if we understand this was part of a broader strategy, that we could also have trauma response teams? What if we understand that we could also uh, have school interventions as a platform for wider trauma-informed community development? What if we could partner with the University of Pittsburgh, which we are, Dr. Valerie Watzlaw, Dr. Lei Ming Zhao, to develop a health assessment tool so that we can have a snapshot of the health of each of these blocks that they too could see and understand so we could measure the impact of our work? What if we could do all of this? 
what implications it could have for our communities who have suffered far too long. And certainly these problems are not limited to Pittsburgh. No, these problems go beyond Pittsburgh. Yes, indeed, they do. What if people came from Chicago? What if people came from Los Angeles? What if people came from New York to Pittsburgh to learn the principles of trauma-informed community development? And what if the work that we did here, starting with one block, began to ripple across our nation? But that's not all. Because, you know, there's problems all over the world. You know, I've been to the Middle East five times in my life, and war has wrecked that region. But when the wars are over, are we just going to rebuild Syria and pretend that nothing has happened? Are we going to rebuild Iraq and pretend that nothing has happened? Like we try to rebuild the Hill District and pretend that nothing has happened. Or Homewood and pretend that nothing has happened. Something has happened. And perhaps one day, if we are about this work, we can inaugurate today a generation of healing that leads to generations of healing. Maybe, maybe today what starts in Pittsburgh could inspire the world to heal from generation to generation that spreads to the four corners of the world. What if today the work that we were doing in Pittsburgh inspired generations of people all around the world to say with gratitude and joy, we have learned in Pittsburgh how to heal broken hearts one block at a time.